Today we have some real fun, some local history that's become national history. Um, Jeff Gwynn's book, Go Down Together, the true untold story of Bonnie and Clyde. Um, uh, it, it came out for the 75th anniversary of the ambush in Gibsland in 1934, so it came out in 2009, uh, along with several others. Uh, but this is the best, and I think remains the best. Jeff, Jeff Gwynn is, a, is an author in Fort Worth, uh, recently did Vagabonds. It's the story of Henry Ford and, and, uh, and Thomas Edison and their road trips. Uh, so he's local, but he's got a national reputation. And this, this is really has become a national story. So I want to talk about Go Down Together, the true story of Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, I tell you what made it really important, although, although Bonnie and Clyde were known around the country uh, uh, during their lifetimes, they became really well known with this movie, Bonnie and Clyde, made in the late 60s. Look at this picture. Uh, Gene Hackman, who played Buck Barrow, Blanche, is played by Estelle Parsons. Uh, uh, Clyde is played by Warren Beatty. Faye Dunaway plays Bonnie, and Michael Pollard plays a composite role of all the people that travel with Bonnie and Clyde. Ralph Fultz and W.D. Jones and Henry Methvin, and uh, he's, a, he's a, a fictional character. But this is the movie that launched uh, the, the craze of Bonnie and Clyde. A lot of it was filmed locally, um, and, and that's how it started. My interest in Bonnie and Clyde began with a client, Ralph Fultz, who was the first and the last of the Barrow Gang. I remember when Ralph came to the office, uh, one of our staff members had a husband who was... Uh, an assistant to Bill Decker, and uh, her eyes widened, and she came in and said, Ralph Fultz is in the lobby. And I said, well, uh, okay. And uh, she knew who Ralph Fultz was, the first and last of the Barrow Gang. Uh, Ralph, uh, we represented Ralph for 25 years. Uh, Ralph uh, was really a pretty nice guy and, and uh, worked for the Buckner Orphans Home, uh, gave, gave speeches to high school students on going straight and all that. Raised a family. Uh, uh, he, he was the only one to survive uh, what happened in the 1930s. Uh, so let's talk about what happened in the 1930s. Um, this book is really about, it tells us a lot about Dallas, what it was like uh, in the 20s and in the 30s. And that's one of the valuable pieces of this book. It's, it's a well-told vignette of, of Dallas in that era. A lot of people don't realize um, Dallas basically uh, uh, had a place for people who were coming in from the country. It was across the river. It was West Dallas, the Devil's Back Porch. Uh, people don't realize uh, right after World War I, uh, when Europe no longer needed so much farm produ produce from the United States, all of a sudden they could till their own fields. There was a huge agricultural depression in Texas. Farmers could raise crops, uh, but they couldn't sell them for a price that made it worth raising them. And all of a sudden, there was this giant influx of folks from the country, farmers from all over Texas. They came into Houston and San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, uh, people always think of 1929 as, as, as being the beginning of the Depression. The Depression for Texas farm folks began in 1920. And part of the uh, group that came flowing in from the country poor uh, were the Barrows and, and, and Emma Parker and her daughters. Um, it, uh, Dallas put them in West Dallas, what we call Cement City, uh, the place that... Uh, uh, really had no running water. I, take a look at this. That's, that's a little bit of the devil's back porch right there. Um, it was kind of a scandal. You could live there and you could look across the river and see a brighter, shinier Dallas, but you weren't any part of it. And basically, um, uh, without running water, with all kinds of diseases, with the resultant crimes that were committed by these desperate people, uh, it became kind of a tough place. Uh, the people who originally took some initiative in trying to cure that were the ladies of Dallas. Um, uh, Hattie Rankin was one of them. The Wesley Rankin Center still sits off Singleton uh, on Crosstown in, in West Dallas. Um, 
They, they wanted to make lives of these poor, suffering people better. Uh, what you're seeing here is a pretty much a hand-built shack, and that's what a lot of them were. Um, the Barrows came from Teleco, which is in a little town in, in Ellis County. Um, they had some relatives around here. Some of their older boys uh, were already here, um, including Buck. And they brought the, the youngest, uh, Clyde and Elsie and, and Marie, uh, in, in a wagon. They came in a wagon, and they, where, where do you go? You go to West Dallas. And for a while, they slept under their wagon. Uh, Henry was a junk man. He'd take his wagon around and just gather junk all around town and, and then uh, sell it, sell it by the pound. And, and uh, at some point, he managed to, he managed to uh, uh, build a kind of a shack, a home-built shack. Uh, if, if you want to know these, the area where this was happening, go over sometime to where the Belmont Hotel is up on the hill off Fort Worth Avenue, and there at Sylvan in Fort Worth. Go down Sylvan, and you will, you will, you will meet two little streets, Bayonne, Muncie. Uh, those streets uh, right now is, is probably one of the great uh, shotgun house historical districts in this part of the state, uh, but they all look pretty run down. Those shotgun houses sit where the West Dallas tent camp was, uh, at, at the time that the, the Barrows arrived in Dallas in their, in their wagon. Uh, they would later uh, take what they had built and cart it over to Border and Singleton. Then it was called Eagle Ford Road, and they would, they would build a gas station and they would have the house behind it. Uh, there's only the ruins now of the, of the little houses, generous, the, the shack they had built. Uh, and, and, and a structure that looks kind of like the Barrow store. It's not, not particularly original. But um, anyway, uh, that, was, that was the West Dallas tent camp. That was the Barrow lifestyle. Henry, Henry Barrow's life became a whole lot better after a while when some motorist hit his, hit his horse and killed it, and he could, uh, he could all of a sudden start. He got enough insurance proceeds to be able to buy a vehicle, ramshackle as it was, and still pick up the... Uh, the uh, all the all the junk around that part of town and sell it by the pound. Uh, now, the Parkers. Um, Emma Parker had lost her husband. Uh, they came from Rowena out west, uh, Rowena, Texas, and uh, she, in many ways, had airs. I mean, the kids were dressed up on Sunday morning, and and she was. She felt better than her circumstances, which were impoverished. She had relatives in Dallas also, uh, and so uh, she had daughters. And one of them was one of them was uh, Bonnie. Uh, and let's talk about both Clyde and Bonnie. Kind of a little personality thumbnail on each one of them. Uh, Clyde was kind of short, decent looking. Uh, Big dresser, you know. In that era, dressing snappy meant you were somebody, and so he was a snappy dresser. But he dropped out of school and at the grade school level. I mean, he he had no education. Uh, he there wasn't much by way of jobs for boys in West Dallas, and and so you could go across the river, but you couldn't get a job usually. Uh, as he grew older, he was able to get jobs at places like. Uh, United Glass, uh, Bama Pies, some of those kind of places. Um, but there was a problem for young boys in on the Devil's Porch, uh, and that is um, really how you ended up sort of doing things was you started by stealing chickens, and pretty soon you were stealing bicycles, and then you were stealing cars. And, and so there was kind of a, a, a progression in that. Um, uh, ironically, I even knew even knew Leonard Pack. Leonard Pack was a Dallas uh, law officer in that era, who was, if not the first, then one of the first to arrest Clyde Bear. I remember Mr. Pack in the fifties, uh, and that great big gun he kept on his table in the in the house. But uh, Leonard Pack and, and other police would arrest Clyde Bear as he graduated from chickens to bicycles to cars. As had his older brother Buck. Buck was already stealing things. Uh, it's all it's all ironic because Henry and Kumi were just nice, hard-working farm folks, and, uh, but they were, uh, had always just kind of been down on their luck, and, and uh, uh, Henry, Henry kind of went into the kind of the auto service station stuff 
later. Uh, but basically, uh, there weren't too many routes to success for these guys, and, and wild ones like Buck and Clyde just ended up uh, on the other side of the law. Now, Bonnie. Uh, um, Bonnie had aspirations. She thought she should be a movie star. She wrote poetry. Uh, Bonnie was a smart little girl. Uh, one of the sites that you can still see is the Eagle Ford School, the old town of Eagle Ford. She went to Eagle Ford School. It's right at the base of Chalk Hill Road next to the new great big Amazon facility that's being built there. But she went to school, elementary school, uh, but she couldn't complete any education. There was really no way for a girl uh, who was smart, who had aspiration, who was pretty. Uh, she was a petite little thing. and, and uh, uh, your, your main route to success was to, to marry the right kind of guy if you could, but there weren't just a whole lot of right kind of guys around West Dallas. Uh, at, I forget whether she was 15 or 16 when she married uh, Roy Thornton, but she married Roy Thornton. Uh, people don't realize she was married to Roy Thornton for the rest of her life. She never divorced Roy Thornton. But soon enough after getting married in like 1926 or so, uh, Roy ended up in jail. And so she kind of lost interest with Roy. Uh, and the big meeting in the year, it's, it's 1930, the big meeting uh, at a house on Herbert Street that no longer exists, uh, the big meeting of Bonnie and Clyde was almost love at first sight, need at first sight, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but they saw in each other uh, things that really complimented uh, Bonnie, Bonnie found a man who could make a decision, uh, who dressed well uh, and had some flair. Uh, Clyde found a, a woman who was petite, he was short, uh, petite and kind of clingy and admiring, and they just served each other's needs. And, you know, uh, so that's 1930, and, and uh, basically she's married, but uh, she's done with Roy Thornton. He's in the pen. Uh, and so basically having met, uh, they become greatly devoted to each other. Um, uh, she's a waitress. Uh, she, uh, another site that you uh, can see, it's, it's empty, but over, over by uh, Baylor Hospital, over off of Swiss, uh, it's, a, it's near Swiss and Oak Lawn, a uh, little crescent-shaped, uh, empty, empty facility. Hargrave's Cafe stood there. She, she waitressed at Hargrave's Cafe. In fact, she served Ted Hinton who will later be one of her executioners. Uh, so she knew Ted Hinton. Ted knew her by, by face. She was very friendly. Um, she worked there, and then she worked at a, also at a, at a cafe downtown. So she waitressed. And uh, the problem was Clyde was getting in more and more trouble. Uh, in fact, he was arrested. Uh, Emma said he could spend the night at, at, at their house, and Emma Parker, and he was literally arrested one time the next morning by the police and carried away. Um, his stealing cars had sort of caught up with him. And, and uh, Buck was, Buck was uh, in jail also at various points. But, but Clyde ended up uh, going to the Eastham Prison Farm. And that's where he met, that's where he met Ralph. And, and uh, I wish I had asked Ralph more questions during his lifetime. Ralph died in 1993. It would have been fun to have heard more about uh, how they met. History says how they met, and, and, and John Neal Phillips' book on Ralph says what happened was the paddy wagon that came to pick up people and take them to the Eastern prison unit of our Huntsville uh, prison system uh, picked up Clyde, and it picked up Ralph. Ralph was already a career criminal by this point. And they met on the paddy wagon headed for Easton. Well, the Easton prison experience uh, was tough. The prison system in Texas in that era was mean. Uh, Easton was a prison farm, uh, and and you worked you worked the outdoors and you, you took care of crops and all that sort of thing. Uh, Ralph and 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 Clyde became friends. Uh, Clyde, being sort of a small guy was easy prey for predatory trustees. They used fellow prisoners as trustees. He was repeatedly raped and sexually abused by one of the, of the uh, uh, 
supervisors who was a fellow uh, fellow prisoner. Uh, but you know, nobody ever pinned it on him. But he found a time one time to ambush a guy from behind, killed him with a pipe, got rid of that situation. But uh, Clyde Barrow always kind of had a chip on his shoulder, and he was incredibly uh, bitter after his experience at the Easton Prison Farm. Uh, interestingly, in that era, one of the great ways to get out of prison was to have an accident and, and have some sort of disability that would get yourself out. Uh, Clyde's mother, Kumi, was, uh, was working with uh, Governor Ferguson, Ma Ferguson's office, to try to get him a pardon. Uh, Clyde didn't know that, uh, but Clyde figured out a way to cut off his toe on one of his feet. And having cut off his toe, uh, he got a pass to get out of Easton that way limp the rest of his life. People don't realize that. Clyde Barrow had a limp because he cut off his own toe to get out of Easton. Uh, unfortunately, little did he know his mother would have gotten him a pardon not all that much later. But anyway, Clyde got out of prison and, and uh, back to West Dallas. The, the Barrows were a close family. Uh, you know, there was the service station there at Borger and Eagle Ford and, and uh, uh, you know, had brothers and sisters in Dallas, and, and including his little sister Marie, and, and his parents had the, had the service station. Uh, but um, Clyde was kind of at this point in sort of a life of crime, and he had met somebody named Raymond Hamilton. If you don't know that name, you don't know Dallas crime in the 20s and 30s. Uh, Raymond Hamilton um, was also a friend of Ralph Fultz. Uh, Ralph did uh, tell the interesting story about. Uh, of what happened to him? He was a native of uh, he was a native of McKinney, and he was walking downtown uh, past the old jail, uh, which is no longer a jail, you know. No, I think it's on Tennessee, wherever. Uh, and a voice from out of the bar said, "What are you doing?" And Ralph said, "Who are you?" And they started talking, and that's how Ralph Fultz and Raymond Hamilton met. Well, Raymond Hamilton also came to to. Uh, to run with Clyde Barrow, and, and they were like oil and water. They did not mix well, but they ran together. Uh, Raymond Hamilton was a major criminal in his own right. Uh, and so um, let's go forward a little bit to 1932 uh, at a place that still exists. It's on Winneka. It wasn't Winneka Street back then. It's a little duplex uh, on the property of Wesley Rankin Center. Uh, the people living there, the, uh, knew, knew uh, Raymond Hamilton. The law officers were staking it out to try to get Raymond Hamilton. And it was Clyde Barrow who ended showing up. Part of the, part of the law officers that were there to ambush Raymond Hamilton, uh, one of them was Malcolm Davis, an officer from Fort Worth. Uh, Clyde Barrow showed up instead. There was some gunfire. Clyde shot and killed Malcolm Davis. When Malcolm Davis was, was shot, uh, that, that kind of cut it. That was, uh, at, from that point forward, uh, Clyde Barrow would have been, would have been um, electric chair material, period. Uh, but um, just before that, actually, uh, Clyde and Bonnie and Ralph Fultz had tried to knock over a store in Kaufman. Uh, you know, in that era, people carried weapons with them a lot, and and people just started coming out and shooting at them, <laughs> and, and so uh, they 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 did not successfully uh, rob that store in Kaufman. Instead, uh, they ended up with Clyde getting away in his souped-up car. He always he loved Fords, and he loved V8s. He loved big engines. Uh, but somehow Bonnie and Ralph ended up on a donkey in the rain. They were found. They were thrown in the jail in Kemp. Uh, Bonnie was let out because at that point Bonnie had no record. Uh, Ralph was taken straight to jail because he did. And, and uh, so you had that incident in, in, uh, in Kaufman just before the Winneka shooting. Uh, you had another incident in Hillsborough where, where basically uh, Clyde was driving the car, and, and others shot and killed uh, th the man in Hillsborough. And so there had ar already been a death. But when Malcolm Davis, when a law officer was shot and killed like that, that's, that is serious. Now, uh, Bonnie and Clyde always made 
loops in their V8s. Um, they would go into Oklahoma, Missouri, Iowa, Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico even. Um, in that era, if you cross state lines, law officers kind of lost uh, jurisdiction. Uh, what you got to keep in mind in this era is that law officers carried a lot of times handguns they bought themselves, you know, a very low power weaponry. Uh, their jurisdiction went to the state line and, and all Bonnie and Clyde had to do was cross the state line to go into another jurisdiction. That's one of the things that led to the formation of the FBI, which was already being consolidated by Hoover in the 20s and, and into this era in the 30s, uh, so that you could kind of have an interstate response to people like this. But they would loop around, but they always came home. And, and they came home uh, to the gas station. Uh, there were all these elaborate, uh, all these elaborate uh, systems of turning lights on and off and throwing Coke bottles with messages and all that sort of thing. Because law officers were, were on the lookout for Bonnie and Clyde by this point. Uh, but they always came back, they always came back to family. Uh, but they always did loop. Uh, one, another major killing took place uh, in Oklahoma, if, if you take a drive from Dallas to Tulsa, you'll go by on the highway a place called Stringtown. Well, one night, uh, Clyde, not with Bonnie, but with uh, uh, Raymond Hamilton, attended a dance at Stringtown, and some deputies, uh, a sheriff and deputy, showed up, and they shot and killed both of them in Oklahoma. So uh, the string of law officer killings is, is getting more intense. Um, Maybe the, the first of the really close scrapes for Bonnie and Clyde was at, uh, was at um, um, Joplin, Missouri. They were staying at a court in Joplin and, uh, and basically uh, the law found out about it. They surrounded them and they had to blast their way out of Joplin and they did. They actually, uh, the, the, the more law officers killed, uh, they blasted their way out of the surround, uh, being surrounded at a at a, a court, an overnight court in, in Joplin, um, uh, made, made it even worse. I mean, it, they're way beyond any saving at this point. But uh, you're looking now at a picture of Bonnie Parker. Uh, Bonnie is holding a gun. She's smoking a cigar. And this is a staged shot. It's just kind of, a, she didn't smoke cigars. She didn't really carry guns herself. There were an armory in the car, but she didn't normally carry handguns or smoke a cigar. This is a kind of a spoofy, for fun shot, a series of shots that were taken uh, out who knows where. Bonnie and Clyde uh, lived what can't be called a glamorous life because they, they were in the hinterlands hiding all the time, but they took these fun pictures. These were undeveloped pictures that were in the uh, in the uh, motel room uh, after they blasted their way out of Joplin. Law officers got a hold of these and that's where these pictures came from uh, where it was the undeveloped film that they picked up in, in Joplin, Missouri. And, and so uh, uh, there, there were all kinds of spoofy shots that you'll, you'll see of, of uh, Bonnie and Clyde. Now, in this, uh, in this era, there was also an accident in Wellington, Texas that people don't realize much about. Um, Clyde was uh, out in West Texas driving uh, fast in the dark uh, and missed a detour sign and ran off a, a, a bridge under construction, rolled the car, and the battery acid got on Bonnie's leg, ate parts of it to the bone. Uh, and so here you have a fugitive who has a real medical issue and they just had to doctor her on the go as they went along after Wellington. Uh, people don't realize that, that Bonnie often needed, she, she held on to Clyde because she could not sometimes stand up by herself. Uh, she was basically made lame by that, by that accident in, in Wellington. But, um, You've all got the stories. Uh, if, if you know people who've lived in Dallas all their lives, they'll tell you about their great aunt or great uncle or great, you know, whatever, 
who Bonnie and Clyde stopped or they saw Bonnie and Clyde or, you know, whatever. It's, it's kind of legendary in Dallas. The, uh, um, but let's get on with the looping because after Joplin, um, there was one other, well, it's more than a close call. Uh, it was, it ended up with Buck and Blanche being captured and Buck dying, but Platte City, Missouri, they, they moved on to Platte City, Missouri and the law found out they were there and they surrounded the, the court that they were in again. And again, they were able to blast their way out of it. But Buck got hit in the head with a shot that took part of his skull, actually. Uh, I mean, it was, a, it was most probably from the get-go a mortal wound, but he lived several days. Uh, Blanche had, had uh, glass from the shattered glass in her eyes, so uh, she was having trouble with her eyesight. So later, um, right, after, right after Blanche's eyes are uh, hit by this shattered glass and Buck is, you know, part of his brain's exposed, they drive over to Dexter Park in Iowa. Uh, it was an old amusement grounds and Dexter Park um, uh, was basically empty at this point. They set up camp, but some locals saw them and they reported it to police officers and the police officers surrounded Dexter Park. Now they've surrounded Joplin and the Barrel Gangs blasted their way out. They've surrounded Platte City. They've, they've gotten away again. Now they surround at Dexter Park and, and when they start shooting, Bonnie and Clyde get away again. But Blanche and Buck do not. Um, here, here's a picture taken at the time. Right on the spot, you see Blanche is wearing dark glasses and, and kind of resisting and uh, quite obviously distraught. Uh, sitting on the ground is Buck, of course, who could barely function. He was, and, and would die in the next couple, two or three days. Uh, but uh, this, is a, this is a contemporary picture of of the capture at, at, at Dexter Park. And, and uh, uh, basically, uh, after that, um, it was kind of downhill. Uh, Bonnie and Clyde got away, but the fact is um, um, time was getting short. You know, all of this happened in three years, just three years from basically let's say from 1931 to 1934 where it was the height of it all. Uh, Bonnie and Clyde would come back. They would almost be ambushed at, at Sowers, which is in, on Sowers Road, which is in Irving. You, it's now asphalted over. You can't see anything at Sowers. But they're almost caught visiting with family at Sowers. Um, uh, but Clyde has a plan, and Clyde's plan uh, reflects his bitterness about what happened to him at Easton. He's going to break into the Easton prison camp. It's a farm, prison farm. He's going to break in and he's going to bust out everybody he can that he knows. Uh, and this happens in, I believe it was February, early in 1934. Um, and they attack the Easton prison farm. That attack is the beginning of a pretty good new movie about uh, Bonnie and Clyde and the pursuit of Bonnie and Clyde called The Highwayman. Uh, and uh, it, it was produced by Netflix, I think, has major stars. And, and uh, it's the story of how Frank Hamer, and, uh, aided by Manny Galt, pursued uh, Bonnie and Clyde there from, from the Easton breakout until uh, May when they, were, uh, when they ambushed them. Uh, so it's just a short few month period, but uh, basically um, uh, the the raid on Easton Prison Farm killed a prison guard, another law officer. Um, they were able to break out. I think W. D. Jones, Henry Meth, and Raymond Hamilton. They got them all. The thing that saved Ralph and allowed him to live a long life and and go straight and work at the orphan's home and help young kids try to go straight was the fact that they had moved Ralph the day before to another part of the prison farm. 
And so when Bonnie and Clyde broke into uh, Easton Prison Farm, they could not get Ralph. They got the others and hit the road. Uh, now, one thing I think is not particularly historically accurate, and that is Bonnie seems to walk just okay uh, when, when she does her part in the Easton Raid. A fact is, uh, she had a hard time walking because of that leg that had been injured at Wellington. Uh, but they, they broke them out, and so now they're out. Um, Clyde and Raymond Hamilton break up, and Raymond Hamilton goes his way. And uh, Bonnie and Clyde, um, the next major thing in their saga uh, happens on Easter Day of 1934. And this was maybe the turning point. Um, it was bad enough to shoot a law officer and, and, and break, break major criminals out of the Texas prison system at the Easton Farm. It was another thing what happened on Easter Day in 1934. Uh, they were hanging out in a car with Henry Methvin, and, and who, who they had broken out of Easton. Uh, Henry was a Louisiana boy. That will play in a little bit later. Uh, they were sitting out on Dove Road. If you, go, if you go to Grapevine and go to Dove Road, and go down Dove Road, you will find a big stone marker that marks the place that the two motorcycle officers were killed. What happened is Bonnie and Clyde and Henry were sitting in a car down at the end of a dirt road, and the officers were passing by. One of them had just either just gotten married or was about to be married. It was his, almost his first day on the force. Uh, they saw some people kind of lurking down the road, and they pulled over, uh, and they were both shot and killed. Now, I think another historical inaccuracy in the highwayman, but dramatically it works, is they have Bonnie shoot uh, the officers. There's no evidence to believe that Bonnie Parker ever shot anybody. Uh, she was infatuated with Clyde. Clyde shot plenty of folks, but Bonnie was kind of along for the wild ride. She was, she was a criminal conspirator, but uh, but no, this, this idea that she shot them, what that's based on, and, and uh, I, I won't mention his name because I don't want everybody calling him now, but a, a friend of mine in Dallas, Carl's uh, grandfather, was the man on the farm next door who said he saw a small person get out of the car and go over and shoot the law officers who had both been shot, uh, execute them basically on the ground. Uh, and he identified it as Bonnie. Even Carl says, my grandfather couldn't see that. He was wrong, and you know, it's just, it's not true. Uh, but it's dramatic, and that's the way the highway, highwayman has Bonnie shooting them. The one who shot them most probably was not even Clyde. It was Henry Methvin. Uh, the, the, the thought is that Henry Methvin, th there was some miscommunication, and Henry Methvin killed both law officers. Uh, at that point, public opinion kind of turned. Throughout the period of Bonnie and Clyde's uh, going around the country doing these things, people saw it as kind of a what the establishment deserved. You know, this was the height of the Depression. People were being foreclosed on. And here were these wild young people going around, you know, uh, flaunting, flaunting the law and, and doing all that sort of thing uh, made, made, uh, made uh, people... Uh, really want to read the newspapers, and so they became kind of legendary. But shooting a couple police officers, particularly one who's just new on the job and it was, either had just gotten married or was about to get married, it was just that was a little too much for for anybody. Um, now, uh, here I want you to see a picture of Bonnie and Clyde in this period. Um, you notice Bonnie is it looks like she's smoking a cigarette, but she's she's kind of clinging to Clyde, and she's not clinging to Clyde because just because she's clinging, she's clinging to Clyde because a lot of the time she needed Clyde to prop her up because of that leg. And so uh, uh, they lived a pretty hard life out in the middle of nowhere eating pork and beans and you know knocking over little, little convenience store kind of operations. It was not a glamorous life. In fact, it was so unglamorous, uh, other major criminals like uh, Dillinger, who would himself die in, in, uh, in the summer of 1934, um, uh, they were kind of dismissive of Bonnie and Clyde as kind of small town crooks. You know, they just weren't, Dillinger didn't think they were on his level. But Ralph would say, and that's one thing Ralph always did say, was, was that, uh, and I think he may be letting themselves off a little bit easy, but he would say, 
we were just kind of wild kids. If we saw that Dillinger was doing something, or, or, or uh, Pretty Boy Floyd, or, or Babyface Nelson, or any of these folks who were the public enemies of the early 30s, if they were doing something, we'd imitate it. You know, we, we couldn't, we had to one-up whatever they one-upped us on, and so uh, he portrayed as kind of a wild young men uh, about. But, but the long and short is, is after, after the Easter shootings on, on the Dove Road, uh, Governor Ferguson, Ma Ferguson, uh, detailed. Uh, she had already asked Frank Hamer to to uh, to start looking for him, and that's what the Highwayman's all about: is is the the Frank Hamer pursuit of Bonnie and Clyde all over the place. Um, what finally broke it as they as they moved from state to state, uh, using the fact that they were better armed than the lawmen that that that. Uh, state lines prohibited lawmen crossing over and following them, using all that as they looped around all the time. Uh, it, it made it hard, but they finally found out a way to deal with that, and it was uh, by a trader, a, a, an informer. And, uh, uh, and, and keep in mind, Bonnie and Clyde, that car was so armed, you wouldn't believe it. Now, now guns from that car that are now, they'll, they'll sell for a quarter million dollars for a handgun. I mean, it's just incredible. But um, that car was so much more armed than any law officer that they would ever encounter. Um, basically, um, uh, there was no way you would take Bonnie and Clyde alive. You'd die trying to, trying to tell them to halt or something like that. But, but, but the bottom line is, um, Ironically, the traitor uh, was the guy that they had broken out of the Easton Prison Unit, the guy that probably was the one who killed the two law officers on Easter Day that year. Uh, it was Henry Methvin. Uh, Henry, Henry had a record that he would like to have been out of from under, and his father, Ivy, approached uh, state authorities to talk about what would happen uh, if they told them where Bonnie and Clyde were, they knew because Bonnie and Clyde at this point had looped into Louisiana. They were in the Arcadia area uh, and, and basically in Bienville Parish. And basically uh, a deal was negotiated for, for, uh, for Methvin to get a pardon and for his dad Ivy to set up Bonnie and Clyde. And so introduce you to the execution team. Um, uh, bottom uh, kneeling on the bottom left is Frank Hamer, who was kind of in charge of this operation. Um, included included uh, on his, on his left is is the sheriff of Bienville Parish. Above that, uh, on the far right of the picture, is Manny Galt, uh, formerly of the Texas uh, Rangers, as as was uh, Frank Hamer. Um, uh, deputy, deputy to the to the sheriff of Bienville Parish, and the two guys, uh, the, the two of the guys in the back are are uh, Ted Hinton, who knew Bonnie very well. That's one of the reasons he was there. Ted knew Bonnie and Clyde. He'd seen them both. Bonnie'd served him lunch and dinner at the cafe, uh, and and uh, Bob Alcorn, and so that was that was the team. Uh, unlike what the what the what the setup was is that Ivy knew that Bonnie and Clyde would be coming down the road in one of those fast Fords at a certain time, and the way he would get them stopped was he would look like he was, uh, had, had his truck had broken down and he'd be standing beside it. Uh, these six men were standing in the bushes with high-powered weapons, and basically uh, as, as Clyde rounded the corner, he did slow down, uh, uh, to, to help Ivy Methvin uh, with his supposedly broken down truck. These guys rose out of the bushes, immediately fired uh, uh, pictures afterwards, taken moments later of moving pictures, show smoke still all around. <laughs> the smoke of this stuff is still all around this car. Uh, don't believe what happened in the highwayman when when uh, Kevin Costner, as as Frank Hamer, walks out and says stop or whatever he said, and and nobody walked out and said stop. Nobody would get around that that car full of all those that weaponry. 
they just rose up out of the bushes and started firing and kept firing. Uh, and and uh, uh, the result was the famous bullet-ridden car. And so um, what, what pursued in, in uh, short order was kind of like a zoo. You hate to say that, but they towed the car with the body still in it uh, back to Arcadia to a funeral home. Uh, people were reaching inside trying to get pieces of cloth and watches and I saw one of those watches sold for $35,000 recently. Uh, I, I wanted to show you this. I uh, collect all the, the wanted posters of the, of the great public enemies of the early 30s and, and uh, this is Bonnie and Clyde and you notice all the different names under which she went. Mrs. Roy Thornton, which was her true name, uh, Mrs. Roy Thornton, Bonnie Parker, Mrs. Clyde Barrow, etc. Clyde had all kinds of interesting names. Uh, Clyde, he was Clyde Champion Barrow, uh, but he also looks like he used a Jack and Eldon and all kinds of different names. Uh, FBI was trying to nose into this. It was really a local operation, like I say. It was uh, the, the, the group that, that Hamer, uh, under the governor's authority, had formed. Um, and the FBI did not really play any part of this. Who would have liked to have been part of this? But th this is actually was never posted on a wall. These, these were sitting there ready to be mailed out when they were killed. And that's why they're collector's items now. The people took them all and you know, sell them to collectors. But, but basically, back to Dallas and, and part of the ongoing zoo. My grandmother was part of it. My grandmother was at the services for, for Bonnie Parker over at the McCamey Funeral Home in Oak Cliff, it no longer exists. A Clyde, a Clyde service was held over at, the, at, at Sparkman Belo, the Belo Mansion, the Dallas Bars, uh, Colonel Belo's old mansion was a funeral home at that point. Uh, each one of them drew crowds in the thousands. Uh, their, their funeral was not joint, and one of the reasons their funeral was not joint was that um, Emma Parker turned it down. Kumi and Henry Barrow would have let it be joint. But she said, you know, that man had my daughter during her lifetime. He cannot have her now. Uh, she never really approved of Clyde Barrow. And so they were separate services. And, and basically, um, you know, it, it was a zoo. Uh, thousands at, at both places. Um, now, the postscript to all of this, uh, this, this was, this was kind of we're coming to the end of the public enemies uh, era in, in American history as the FBI rises and interstate crime becomes much harder to carry off. Bonnie and Clyde were killed May 23rd of 1934. Uh, later, um, uh, Dillinger was killed in the summer by the FBI. Uh, Preboy Floyd was killed in Oklahoma early that fall. Uh, Babyface Nelson was killed up, up north uh, toward the end of that year. And then the next, the next year, um, um, the Barker gang was ambushed in, I think, the very beginning of 1935. Uh, and, and basically, um, the Barkers were killed at a lake house in Florida. The next year, they finally got the brains of the Barker gang, who was Alvin Karpus. And Karpus was... was uh, was basically arrested in 1936. And that was really the end of the public enemy era as we know it. Uh, but, uh, but, but the bottom line, let me, let me just talk about uh, what happened to folks after this. Uh, I am sorry to this day, and it was about a year and a half ago that I did not buy a piece that came up for auction. The sheriff of Dallas County was a man named Schmood Schmidt. Schmood Schmidt tried over and over again at Sowers and all kinds of places to get Bonnie and Clyde. He never did, uh, but he obviously found humorous certain parts of it because um, he kept it in his scrapbook. Uh, one of the national auction houses sold a bunch of uh, Schmood Schmidt stuff recently, um, and one of them was a Christmas card. A little little nice little folks with parasols that said Merry Christmas and all that sort of thing. It was posted from Cooper, Texas. It was just addressed as often in that era, uh, Sheriff Schmood Schmidt, uh, Dallas, Texas. Well, he got it. 
And when he opened it up and kept it all his life, it was sold at the auction. It just sold a little higher than I was willing to pay. Uh, he, you open it up, and on the uh, little Merry Christmas and below it just says, Raymond Hamilton. He sent him a Christmas card while he, while he was on the run and it posted it from Cooper, Texas. Well, uh, it was the next spring that things finally uh, happened, and sh then Deputy Sheriff Bill Decker uh, got the drop on Raymond Hamilton from behind, took him alive, and within weeks uh, he was executed at Huntsville. Uh, and so that's what happened to Raymond Hamilton. Uh, of course, uh, we're leaving out Blanche. Whatever happened to Blanche? Well, she spent some time in jail. And, and, but Blanche, I never knew Blanche. It's funny. I knew Ralph. Any, anybody that lived around Dallas, uh, uh, particularly East Dallas, Pleasant Grove area, uh, knew Ralph. But um, Blanche lived in Seagaville and, and uh, knew a lot of people in Seagaville, represented a lot of folks in Seagaville, but I never met Blanche. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Blanche later moved to a, moved to a, uh, a little uh, trailer home on Cedar Creek Lake. Uh, she was the only one of those four that was living when the movie Bonnie and Clyde was made. Uh, she was an, an, a, uh, an advisor to the film. She was furious because she thought, she thought Estelle Parsons had played her like a, what she said, like a screaming Mimi. She made me look like a screaming Mimi. Uh, but anyway, uh, Blanche Barrow Frazier, she married Eddie Frazier later. Uh, she's buried at Grove Hill, as is, as is Ralph. Um, Bonnie is buried at Crown Hill Cemetery. Um, she was originally buried at the Fish Trap Cemetery in, in, um, in uh, out off of off of Singleton, if you know where where Fish Trap Road is, a lot of the Reunion Colony people are out there. But her mother saw fit at, at uh, her uh, at such time as she thought the neighborhood was changing in its racial composition. <laughs> so, ironically, she thought the cemetery was no good for Bonnie anymore. She moved Bonnie to Crown Hill Cemetery and Webb Chapel. You can go see her grave on Webb Chapel Road. And, and Ralph was the last of them. Ralph died in 1993, led an honorable life after all of this, and, and really tried his best to make society better. Um, this is the book I'm talking about, Running with Bonnie and Clyde, The Ten Fast Years of Ralph Fultz. John Neal Phillips, local historian, does Bonnie and Clyde tours, uh, a lot based on information that Ralph uh, gave him. Uh, and and basically, um, it's a great book. I, I, I highly recommend Phillips is a great writer. And so uh, whether you're doing uh, Go Down Together or Running with Bonnie and Clyde, uh, you will be well advised to read both of those books. Now, Clyde himself is buried in Western Heights Cemetery. Um, if you go down Fort Worth Avenue, there's a little cemetery amongst all those car dealerships and little motels and things. It used to be you had to get a key from Buddy Barrow or there was a church, but you never could get them. It had to make real arrangements to get in. They've, they've opened a small walkway now you can go in. Uh, most people going in, obviously, to visit the grave of Clyde Barrow. Um, you go in and if, if they haven't kept it clean for a while, you will find shell casings plastic guns, old liquor bottles, all that sort of thing. Um, they try to keep it as clean as they can, but the, the, the part about that that is so um, touching really is, is the gravestone itself. Clyde and Buck are buried uh, uh, in, in, with, with a tombstone, and the reason they are is because the Barrows couldn't, couldn't afford two tombstones. And so when Buck died, Henry and Kumi uh, determined that, that, um, that they basically uh, would just have to do it with one tombstone because Clyde would not be all that far behind. And so uh, when Clyde was killed, uh, you know, uh, his name was added to the other side. So one, one side of the tombstone is Clyde, one side is Buck. And, but maybe the most maybe the most uh, poignant thing is, uh, is is what's inscribed on the tombstone, uh, uh, gone but not forgotten. <laughs> and oh oh how true that is. 
Uh, there's little you can see now. Uh, other, the old Barrow, the old Barrow gas station uh, at Border and Singleton, may not be long for this world. Uh, the area in Muncie and Bayonne and all that uh, is, is falling to all this new construction as that whole area uh, gentrifies. Uh, Bonnie's old school, uh, Eagle Ford School there on Chalk Hill Road is still there. The inscriptions on, on Dove Hill, maybe the most fascinating Bonnie and Clyde site that's still around. Uh, and I forget the little side street, but if you go out Singleton far enough, you will come to a light, and, and when you, you can take a right on a little gravel road and go about a, 200 feet. And on the left in the woods, you can't see it from the highway, but in the woods is this old bridge uh, covered with liquor bottles. They have to clean it up every once in a while, but it's this old bridge in the woods. It's really near where the original Eagle Ford community was, that uh, historic Dallas community. Um, that bridge is one of the old cement bridges that goes over the Trinity River. Uh, there were several of them. That, I think this is the last one. It goes from nowhere to nowhere now, uh, this little stretch of the bridge. Uh, but it's something that really needs to be preserved. It's one of those last remaining uh, old uh, connections with the Bonnie and Clyde story, and, and it's just in the woods there. So uh, I, I challenge you to find it, and, but it's, it's there, and, and, it's, and it's easy to get to. So. That's the story of Bonnie and Clyde, and it is really true what's on the tombstone. Uh, gone but not forgotten. And I recommend this book uh, because uh, Go Down Together also tells you the story of Dallas in the 1920s and 30s, particularly West Dallas and what it was like to be in West Dallas. So it is an eye-opener. I recommend it. Jeff Gwynn's a great writer. So get yourself uh, uh, Go Down Together and get running with Bonnie and Clyde. It's, it's a great read also. Thanks.